here in, in these little teaching clips. Get this started. Sorry, have you gone live? I, I mean, should, should we go ahead? Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nancy Stote, and I'm the media and program specialist here at the Framingham Public Library. Uh, welcome to everyone uh, here in person, and also those of us who are watching at home. Uh, thank you. We're thrilled to have you. Uh, if you know someone who couldn't be here tonight, tonight's program will remain on the library's YouTube page. We're excited to feature this evening Katie McCarthy of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Program at Children's Hospital. Katie is also adjunct, adjunct deaf communities. Tonight's lecture is a part of our lifelong learning lecture series in partnership with Framingham State University. I'd also like to welcome Leah Angeli and Erin McCarthy from the Learning Center for the Deaf here in Framingham who have kindly uh, joined us as interpreters tonight. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, please do silence your cell phones. The lecture will be about 45 minutes and then there will will be about 15 minutes of questions. We have some evaluation forms in the back. We'd love to hear from you, uh, your thoughts about tonight's event, as well as any ideas you have for the future. And we'd like to thank our sponsors, the Joseph L. and Ray L. Freund Foundation, courtesy of Elizabeth F. Fideller. And thank you to the friends of the Framingham Library who make events like these possible. The next lecture in this series is in two weeks on Thursday, March 23rd. We'll be featuring Dr. Chu N. Lai, Assistant Professor of Education and Child and Family Studies at Framingham State University. He'll be discussing uh, reimagining learning for tech-involved children. We hope you can join us. And with that, it is my pleasure to welcome Katie McCarthy. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here tonight. It's nice to see all of you here with me. As Nancy mentioned, I work at Framingham State University. I am an adjunct professor, so it's a great collaboration between Framingham State and the library, their lifelong learning series this year. We have an interpreter training program at FSU and a deaf studies program, which is a four-year degree. I teach ASL 1 and deaf culture there for five years now. So I'm very grateful to the Framingham Public Library for inviting me tonight. Tonight I'd like to focus on deaf culture and awareness. And I picked this type of topic because I know how many people may have encountered a deaf person but aren't sure how to bridge communication or maybe have never met a deaf person but will eventually. And it could become a family member or if you're in the grocery store, you never know when you might meet a deaf person. So it's kind of nice to start with a goal of how to feel comfortable interacting with deaf people. And kind of getting an idea of where that person is coming from with their culture and language. So I'd like to break down some barriers tonight. My full-time job is at Boston Children's Hospital. I'm the coordinator of outreach and support services in the Deaf and Hard of Hearing program. I've worked there since 2014. Throughout my job, I provide a lot of training, workshops, events, and education for families and the community um, related to the hospital itself. So, I've given many presentations on a variety of different topics, self-advocacy, all of the isms, autism, ableism, and a variety of different things. So that's been my experience so far. Oftentimes, uh, now with movies and TV shows, 
featuring deaf characters, it's becoming more prevalent. There's more deaf representation in the media, in books, there's more information out there in general, movies and TV shows. I'm sure you have seen some yourself, perhaps a commercial or a movie with a deaf character or a person in it. I know 20 years ago, there was virtually no deaf representation. Marley Matlin was in Children of a Lesser God and there might have been one or two others. A one-off one occurrence on a TV show, perhaps. But we have advocated for more equal representation to have deaf people be more visible in the media. These pictures on the screen just represent a few that are out this year. The top left corner is Creed Three. There's a deaf actress in that show. Then there's New Amsterdam with a deaf doctor. The Eternals has a deaf Marvel character in there. And the movie Coda that won an Oscar. So many people have been able to watch these from their living room or the movie theater and say, wow, that's really cool to see a person signing right there on the screen, or that's really neat. Deaf people are very expressive and they have, they use a lot of facial expression, but translating that from the screen to real life maybe hasn't happened yet. And it's a very different experience meeting a deaf person in real life than watching them on TV or the movie screen. So we can talk more about that and how to bridge communication with deaf, deaf people. The truth is we are everywhere. I mean, we're not gonna sneak up behind you. <laughs> you never know where a deaf person might be. But um, you might meet a deaf cashier at a store or maybe a customer who's deaf, or perhaps a deaf doctor, a deaf vet. There are many uh, deaf people in a variety of different levels of professions. It could be your neighbor, your church member. Uh, there are a variety of different places where you might encounter deaf people. Oftentimes hearing people, we use the term hearing to describe people who can hear, who are not deaf. So hearing people often don't know what the right thing to say is. They don't know the right terminology, they're unsure of how to proceed, whether uh, something will be offensive or not. So I'd like to break down that initial fear and that barrier of being willing to interact with deaf people so that hopefully you'll understand a little bit more about how to bridge that communication gap. There are some areas where there are deaf police officers and cashiers, a variety of restaurants, deaf baristas at Starbucks. And there are even, um, have, there's a neighborhood who learned sign language because one of their neighbors had a deaf child. And that was in Newton, where uh, a neighborhood turned up and learn to sign language together. Then we have a child in the classroom. Sometimes deafness can feel invisible. For example, you meet me. Would you know that I'm deaf immediately if you just saw me? Probably not. So it can take people by surprise. And they might feel like, oh, you're, you're deaf. I'm not sure what to do next or how to proceed. Most of the time, you know, that's people tend to understand and figure out ways to communicate, whether it's using gestures, writing back and forth. But other times people get completely frozen. They might just walk away or they're like, I don't, I don't know what to do at all. So I've encountered different responses from people. But yeah, I'm used to that.
So I'd like to talk about how diverse the deaf community is. We have different terms up on the screen that I will expand on to help you know what exactly it means for that deaf individual in their perspective, what it means. So the word deaf with a, a lowercase d encompasses anyone who is deaf, who identifies as deaf. So they might know that uh, they are a deaf person. Then the word deaf represented with a capital D uh, refers to people who are in deaf community, in the culture, who know ASL sign language and they develop their identity as a deaf person. Deafness is essential to their identity. For example, um, for me, I call myself deaf with a capital D. I didn't know that growing up. I just, you know, I, I knew I was deaf. It wasn't until I met other deaf people and learned from them that it can become an identity and be part of the deaf community on a daily basis. And now I'm proud to be deaf with a capital D. So when I communicate with people, I usually tell people I'm deaf. And you might see it with a capital D sometimes or a lowercase d. And it is based on individual preferences. But sometimes it has some significance behind a capital D. Within the deaf community, there are also other identities. For example, deaf blind or low vision, deaf disabled, deaf plus. About 30 to 40% of the deaf community is deaf plus or deaf disabled, meaning that they have an additional diagnosis other than deafness. Late deafened is a term referring to a person who became deaf later in life. They may have already acquired a language, a spoken language they could hear, and they lost their hearing at a later age. And that can refer to anyone, um, even a child, who is potentially in elementary school after they acquired language, all the way up to a senior citizen. So anyone could become deaf um, at, at a later point, which is late deafened. Then hard of hearing, refers to a person who might be able to hear some using assistive technology or a cochlear implant or who has some residual hearing. They might call themselves hard of hearing. And some hard of hearing people identify as deaf as well. So it's important to follow how they describe themselves and their identity. Some people who are hard of hearing um, might say I primarily socialize within the hearing world, but I consider myself hard of hearing, or I'm hard of hearing and I'm primarily in the deaf world. It's really important just to follow their lead. You'll meet people with a variety of communication preferences. They might wear hearing aids or use a cochlear implant or a baja, which means behind the ear. So it, um, it you wear it on your head behind your ear. It goes on the outside because potentially the anatomy of the ear wouldn't be able to fit other devices. So they might have a behind the ear hearing aid. And then there are other people who don't use any type of assistive technology, such as myself. I don't wear hearing aids. I did grow up with hearing aids. And I could hear some a little bit, but over time, my hearing levels went down until I became completely deaf and hearing aids do not benefit me anymore. I think I like the quiet too, actually. Sometimes I like the peace. I don't wanna be inundated with noise all the time. It's kind of nice to be at peace with my thoughts and just to focus. Some deaf people know ASL or American Sign Language and some don't. So when you meet a deaf person, again, just follow their lead. They may know sign, they may not, they may speak or they may not. So you can uh, identify through the communication what their, mo their preferred mode of communication is.
Here are some terms that we don't use within the deaf community that are not culturally appropriate and don't feel a good descriptor. And I'm just one person, but there are others who probably feel the same. However, there are some people who may call themselves hearing impaired for their own reasons, but other people may tell you that hearing impaired is offensive and they want to use deaf or hard of hearing. We're also uh, not crazy about the word disability. Because to us, it's more of a culture and communication, not uh, disability. So we don't typically uh, use the term hearing impairment or disability. Some people will say, oh, you have a communication disorder. And that's not it either. I don't use my voice at all. I can communicate in other ways. I don't have a disorder. Or one old fashioned term was deaf mute. Because at that time, people thought, oh, maybe they can't speak. Um, but that's not really true. So um, that's, that term is not common anymore. So these are terms that we encourage people not to use, to use deaf of hearing, deaf blind, and the other ones that are already heard, following the preps of those individuals. Now I'm going to play a video. Um, the laptop doesn't have sound. Not exactly sure why. I guess it's my laptop. We'll blame. <laughs> um. Hold on the microphone. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to play a video now, and we're going to have our interpreters read the captions since the sound isn't working. Deafness is a spectrum. It's not just one definition. Someone like myself, who's late deaf and I'm deaf in one ear and hearing in the other. Some people view me as a deaf person. Some view me as hearing. But it's not one or the other. I was born deaf. My father is deaf in one ear, so it's hereditary. I'm the youngest of five siblings. The three youngest are deaf blind. I switch between deaf and disabled because I'm also a little person. Being deaf is a big part of who I am, but that's not my only identity. I'm a person of color, biracial, half black, half white, and gay. The condition I have is called Usher syndrome. It's a hearing and vision loss. I grew up oral. A lot of people consider me hard of hearing. People do call me hearing impaired, but I'm not. I'm deaf. People think being deaf is a bad thing, but I see it as a positive thing. The culture, language, and history make me who I am today. The deaf-blind community, tactile ASL, use of space, the culture, all became part of me. I'm learning little by little about pro-tactile, and I can't wait to learn more. I'm most comfortable with speaking English. People with additional disabilities have to think about access and what they want. Do they know what they need? Throughout my educational years, I used note takers. I didn't have interpreters because I didn't know sign language. I didn't know ASL until I was 14. I used cued speech and was mainstreamed throughout high school. I went to a public school in the morning and then a deaf school in the afternoon. It was the best of both worlds. The instructors used ASL, American Sign Language, which I found to be more inclusive. I was in both deaf and hearing classes. 
I wore that bilateral hearing aid cinched across my chest. Very unpleasant. I got a cochlear implant when I was 15, and I went through intensive speech therapy. In high school, I would sit to the far right, since I could hear on my left side. In large group discussions, where there's dynamic conversation going on, I use interpreters. In my own experience, captioning and interpreting together are the most effective. I want more of a long-term designated interpreter. Someone who knows me well, who knows my work. As a black person, I want my interpreter's voice to match me. My culture can't be overlooked. People automatically think deaf people are all the same, but that's not true. We have layers upon layers. When you meet us, have an open mind and an open heart. I hope that gave everybody some perspective on how diverse the deaf community actually is. There's a lot to pack in 45 minutes, um, but just so you can see a little bit, as you meet different deaf people, they have different backgrounds, different experiences, and different preferences. So that's the first step to meeting a deaf person, um, just figuring out what their preferred mode of communication is. Oftentimes, hearing people will start to use lip reading, um, and they just assume that there's a mutual understanding with lip reading, but I'm going to explain a few reasons why that's not always effective. This is a drawing by my friend, Matt Daigle. Um, he does some comic strips, that deaf guy, and they're just about deaf culture and just different topics that are shown. So up here we see, if you want to become a deaf Jedi, how would you be able to read lips? That would be impossible with Obi-Wan Kenobi, Chewbacca, Yoda, all of those characters, right? So that's how some deaf people feel when they're trying to read lips. Some people have a hairy mustache, some might have a different sort of face or facial expressions. And just for various reasons, it might be hard to see. And a lot of things look the same on the mouth. Other people who are hard to read their lips? Bill Melichek. Uh, New England Patriots, Bill Belichick. When I'm watching those films, I'm like, oh. That's impossible. I cannot read his lips. He's not moving his mouth. <laughs> There's another good video called Can You Read My Lips? And it's with a person, um, Rachel Kolb. So I'm going to show this video. It does have some audio in it, so the interpreters will go ahead and speak. And I just want you to see if you can get an idea um, of the visual effects as well. So when I was really young, probably kindergarten or first grade, and we'd go out to recess, and uh, there was this older guy, he might have been in fifth or sixth grade, that always used to pick on us, and I really didn't know what to do about it. Today we went to a high school, and I pet and held many animals. I was posing for a picture with all of my girlfriends, 
And all of a sudden, one of them reached me. Can you read my lips? Can you read her lips? My dog Clementine loves bread. She stole a loaf off of the counter. Can you read his lips? I have two dogs. One boxer, she's seven and a half, and one mixed breed who's eight. I am deaf, but my world is a hearing one. I rely on the visual, not the auditory. The word lip reading implies reading, like reading a book whose text is legible and clear, but the human face isn't a book and lip reading isn't reading. People mumble, people talk fast and laugh loudly. People have facial hair like porcupines, lips like sphincters. People cover their mouths. People have accents. But real conversations don't take place in a studio. Growing up, I used to, that's the end. I lock in on your mouth. I try to grasp with one sense information intended for another. There have been times when I've questioned why I even try to lip read, to wade through this swamp when I could just use sign language. Some deaf people choose to do just that. It's like a different world, a world filled with rich expression and culture. When people sign, they come alive. But I know I want both worlds. Communication is never a given. Tuesday, I woke up, and then she just pulled up my dress down when I was little. My family got a cat, just hit him in the face, a snake, a guinea pig. Last winter, I learned how to ski. I only cried twice. But when lip reading works, when I focus on one legible face and launch into a conversation, something clicks. Right then, I feel something extraordinary. Human connection. So most of the time, people will start to rely on lip reading. It's natural for people to do that right away. That's your immediate instinct because it's what you have to communicate with a deaf person. But sometimes it's not effective and you just have to resort to other modes of communication. You might have to use your phone and text, write back and forth on a piece of paper, gesture it out just so that you can get your point across to the deaf person you're communicating with. Now we're going to talk about best communication practices. Please make sure to get somebody's attention before starting a conversation. Don't be afraid to tap them or wave. Just make sure that they are looking at you. Most of the time when I'm talking with other hearing people, they've already started on a topic and I didn't know because I wasn't looking. So just make sure that you do have eye contact with that person and then go ahead and proceed. Sometimes you'll start the topic and then make sure that the deaf person is following. And do have patience because sometimes you need to repeat and things do take time. Ask the deaf person first what their preferred mode of communication is before you proceed with communicating. Maintain eye contact. That's important in deaf culture because if you're looking away, then 
it feels like you're not really interested in the conversation. So just make sure you are maintaining that eye contact. Hearing people do tend to rely on their ears, so they are able to look away. But when you're speaking with a deaf person, it is more helpful if the deaf person knows that you're understanding each other and you are maintaining that eye contact. You can repeat or rephrase if needed. Make sure that you check in on the noise and the light because maybe you're standing like by a window and it's really hard to see you. Or maybe there might be a fan or some other noise going on close by and people who rely on some hearing to be able to catch some of your speech might also need that noise to be eliminated in order to communicate. Also just have a paper and pen ready. I always have one in my purse with me at all times, so I'm ready in case I just need to uh, write back and forth with somebody. And I'm hoping that others are doing the same and keeping that in mind so you're always prepared. For signing, you have to have visual access in your space. So a lot of people will sometimes forget to turn on captions. Like, I go in, I'm trying to watch something, and there's no captions. I think we are working on that as a society. But restaurants, public places are starting to have captions shown, schools as well. Uh, again, paper and pen, having that handy in case you need to communicate. On Zoom, there are now live caption options. So you can just turn it on, as well as turn on the transcript. And then that way, somebody's able to follow what's being said. Also, you can have an interpreter on the screen. Um, you can have interpreters just ready to communicate. Oftentimes, hearing people aren't really sure first how to use an interpreter. Um, and that's normal. Don't feel bad if you're feeling like, oh, what do I do with this? So it does take time to get used to using an interpreter. Oftentimes people ask me, does your interpreter go with you everywhere, to the store, things like that? <laughs> no, I don't have a personal interpreter every day. Um, I do everything independently. Um, so an interpreter would just communicate, uh, facilitate communication with me and meet me at a place where I'm going where I would need that. So I would request an interpreter specifically for an event or an appointment and sometimes a hearing person will look at the interpreter when we are communicating. And I do ask that you don't just look at the interpreter. I know as hearing people, we tend to look at the person who we hear. But if you look at the deaf person, I can look at you and glance over at the interpreter. And you don't have to say to the interpreter, tell him, tell her. That's not appropriate either. You can just speak directly to the deaf person that you're talking to. Um, because they are the patient, the employee, the consumer. They're the person that you're speaking to, so you can speak directly to them. Make sure that you're also giving enough lag time for the interpreters to finish their process, and then the deaf person can respond. Often, I'm in a meeting where some hearing people are going back and forth and talking, and the interpreter's trying to catch up. So I'd like to participate and interject, but now they're on to a new topic. So just reminding everybody to raise their hands, take turns, wait for the interpreter to stop, and then you can move on to the next person, just so that we have a more equitable access to communication in a meeting. If a deaf person is relying on their auditory access, just make sure that you always have a microphone ready um, sometimes hearing people will be like, oh, we didn't have time for that. Um, that's not working, so we'll just let it go this time. But that's not fair to the deaf or hard of hearing person. So we do need to make sure that we have everything ready prior to a meeting. Um, and if a microphone's not working, you might need to reschedule or just find another way to accommodate that person so they are able to uh, join that meeting or appointment or whatever it is. Um, overlapping often happens too, so make sure that you try to keep that to a minimum. Again, turn taking is very important, just making sure everybody has a chance to follow along in the conversation. Again, we want to reduce environmental sounds because deaf and hard of hearing people do use technology. They might have implants or hearing aids. Again, this is just some people, not all deaf people. But when they do have those things, sometimes they get listening fatigue. So they're accessing all of these sounds all at once. So they might have to take off their hearing aids. They might have to give it some time. There might be some light. 
that's really distracting. It's just a lot of work on your eyes as well when you're accessing communication that way. So just being aware of that. Um, checking in with the deaf person. Hey, do you need me to slow down? Are you following okay? Just making sure that everybody is okay with the environment and able to participate in the conversation. So as we all know, we've been going on three years now with masks and coronavirus, and a lot of people in the deaf community have been experiencing seeing a disconnect because hearing people's facial expressions and mouths are now covered as we're all wearing masks. Now we do have clear masks and other things, but it's still traumatic for a lot of people when they're experiencing trying to communicate with a mask. So making sure that you have a clear mask ready so that a deaf person is able to see your mouth and your facial expressions. Now, a clear mask is not always completely accessible for a deaf person because often there's like a film and it's hard to hear through it. So you just have to make sure you ask them what kind of mask would work for them. Um, if they're using auditory or visual access, they would need a different kind of mask. So it really depends on their preference. I prefer clear masks, um, but that's so that I can see your facial expressions. Other people who are using their hearing might prefer a different mask so that they're better able to hear you. There's a video with how many different masks work best for deaf and hard of hearing people who have different um, preferred modes of communication. It's very interesting to watch and there's so many different kinds of masks for different purposes and different situations. Deaf people belong into a cultural group, which is the deaf culture. And this culture has been long going and people who are involved in the deaf world just feel like they have all of these cultural norms um, and there's a lot of identities within that culture. So hearing people might not really know what exactly is deaf culture. It's only a language, right? Just sign language and you're just deaf. Um, but there is actually some cultural nuances, um, different norms and behavioral standards that belong to deaf culture that somebody outside of the culture might not be aware of. For example, how we applause like this. Um, I know some hearing people are aware with, of that. Instead of clapping, we do this um, because we can't hear clapping. So this is how we do applause. Also, we flick lights to get somebody's attention or we might stomp our feet. Um, in here, it doesn't really work so well because of the carpet, but on like a hardwood floor, you could stomp your feet, you could tap somebody's shoulder. Um, we don't consider that rude to tap somebody's shoulder. We don't consider it rude to flick the lights, but that's just how we get somebody's attention. Another big part of deaf culture is American Sign Language. We do rely on using American Sign Language or ASL. That's so that we have language access and through ASL, we're able to tell stories. We're able to pass down stories from older deaf people. Um, we have deaf jokes, deaf humor. Um, different cultures have different you know, folk stories that they share, and we have that as well as a part of our culture. We also have different social norms. We're a collectivist type of culture. So we work together to make sure that we are just able to make life better for deaf people. So if we recognize discrimination, we are visibly against it. If we see somebody not getting treated right, we try to support them as much as possible to make it right. Another example would be um, how we advocate for children in deaf schools. We're making sure that their educational needs are being met. So we really do a lot within our cultural identity and trying to advocate for other deaf people within our own community and lift them up so that all deaf people are able to thrive. And we just wanna make sure that we are able to maintain this culture even though we have different technological changes, but we just wanna continue that advocating within our culture. Talking about American Sign Language itself, um, how did that get started and why?
American Sign Language started in the year 1817, approximately. Here in New England, a person named Thomas Gallaudet met a deaf neighbor named Alice. And he thought a lot about how to teach her. She had no formal education. At that time, there, was no, there were no schools for the deaf in the United States. So he traveled to Europe because they already had some processes and schools in place. And they have a longer uh, record, historical record of deaf people and how to teach them than the United States does. So he went to uh, Paris, France, and they were using sign language in their schools. So he initially learned French sign language, and he brought back a deaf gentleman with him. And they founded the American School for the Deaf in Hartford, Connecticut. At that time, again, he started by learning French sign language. But there were other areas, pockets around New England, different deaf communities. And they had their own village sign languages as well, including Martha's Vineyard. There's a long history of deaf people living on the island because of genetic deafness. The population was small. A lot of the people stayed on the island. So one out of four people on the island was deaf. Once the deaf school in Hartford opened, deaf people were able to come and get a formal education. So many people came from Martha's Vineyard to the school in Connecticut and brought their signs with them. <clears throat> and combined with other groups, other populations, that became American Sign Language over the course of about 200 years. The language itself has evolved over time just the same as English does. There are always new words being added. There are different dialects regionally. There are different accents. You know, like in Spokane English, you can have different accents depending on what region you're in. And it's similar with signed languages as well. There are different signs for certain words in different regions of the country. So again, the language is constantly evolving, and we're always learning from it. Some of you may already know some signs, or maybe some of you might know some gestures that you, know, that you realize might already be a sign. For example, if I were to do this, put my uh, hand near my mouth, that's pretty self-explanatory, right? Baby, drink. Some of those that are easily recognizable for most people, but they are signs as well. And you just have to keep at it. You know, it's not enough to watch one or two videos to become fluent in sign language. It's really um, a, a lifelong experience. ASL is a huge part of the deaf culture and community, and we want to preserve that as long as we can. Even children or adults who wear assistive technology can pick up sign language as well, because if they take off their devices, they're still deaf. They won't have auditory access, but they will have access to a visual language. So how can I learn ASL? You can take a class. The Learning Center for the Deaf nearby has community classes. You could find, find a class online. And there are different apps for your phone as well that you could download. Books, YouTube. There are many different ways to learn ASL. Some people prefer to learn a specific type of content, and other people just want to know a variety of words and sentences uh, to meet their need of what they are looking to learn in ASL. The important thing is to follow deaf and hard of hearing content creators. There are many talented creators out there, authors and illustrators. If you'd like a list, just let me know. It's hard to list them all here because there are so many. But I want to make sure that you are getting the right resource for learning ASL. There are many people online who 
teach ASL, but maybe they have only learned for a couple of years themselves and they're not signing something exactly accurate. So it's best to go to a deaf uh, content creator or teacher of ASL. This picture is me. I was three years old. I'm at Santa Claus and I'm signing my name, Katie. The reason why I picked this picture is because looking back as a three-year-old child, I already knew signs. I was able to communicate with Santa Claus, right? And growing up, people would say to me, you should get a cochlear implant. How can you hear? I mean, how, if you can't hear, what can you do? Some people say, if you were able to go back in time, would you choose to be born hearing? Or would you choose to have an implant? And that really shows um, a preoccupation with the medical aspects of hearing loss. We place a lot of importance on hearing. And I think if we could all just take a step back and look at deaf people as people, as individuals, and we're all the same, we have the same goals and wishes and passions and the same lives that, that you all do, it really doesn't matter if we can hear or not. So I think if we just look at the overall picture of how to communicate with people for who they are. The last slide talks about accessibility. Accessibility starts with us all. We all need to strive to be more inclusive to break away from the communication barriers that we have become accustomed to. And this tonight is a great first step at breaking down some communication barriers by learning how to communicate with deaf and hard of hearing people through different ways and understanding their way of life as well. So now I'd like to open it up for a Q and A if anyone has any questions. Yeah, so the question was about uh, children using technology to hear, focusing on spoken language, auditory access. There are people who do access that and decide for themselves that they want to use that, as well as sign language. Some people request interpreters in school. Um, and there are different resources available, different access. So yes, of course, I, I agree with you, I think the same for a child to be able to learn sign language is a great resource, but it's hard to encourage um, people around them to acquire ASL. It takes a long time, like any other language. So sometimes it's easier to teach them to speak for the hearing person. It's that they think, oh, they'll use the same language as me. However, they can acquire both. You know, they, they can acquire sign language on their own as well. But yes, the concept is correct. Yes, they could be learning sign and it would be easier for them to access, but that's, that's not always the case. Question over here. The question was, how did Santa Claus communicate with you? They do have deaf Santa Claus, yeah. Yeah, it's really cool because Santa Claus, um, ha they have some uh, deaf Santa. 
or sometimes a hearing Santa who knows sign language. But it's really cool and amazing, right? Access for deaf kids to be able to communicate with Santa Claus. Yeah. The question was, uh, someone has severe hearing loss, appropriate age to get an implant? Babies can receive an implant around 10 to 12 months of age. As young as that. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the family, their decision, with their doctor, whether it's age appropriate or appropriate for them in general. The question was uh, if the deaf people are more likely to be withdrawn or depressed because they're isolated from the general community. And the answer is it depends on the situation. A lot, there are many resources that deaf people have access to nowadays, but perhaps uh, one deaf person's family um, did not learn sign language, or perhaps they live in, in an area where um, there are not many other deaf people around or people to communicate with. So isolation does happen. But again, there are nowadays so many resources out there for deaf people to connect with others. Thank you all. I appreciate you all coming tonight. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> and, and I would just like to thank you very much, Katie, for coming. Um, thank you to Leah and Aaron for interpreting tonight. It was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thank you all for coming here in person and at home. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs>